Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Friday Coffee Meetup. We are so pleased to have you here with us this morning. Friday Coffee Meetup is the largest active innovation, entrepreneurial, and tech meetup in Los Angeles, California. We, I'm Christy Connor, your host. We work to build community and inspire innovation in the Southern California community. Although you are seeing my face right now, there's actually a whole host of people behind the scenes who work each week uh, to put this together. I am going to show you their faces because they are an amazing team who do everything from keeping us uh, organized each week and logistics to our YouTube channel um, and getting our speakers together. So although you see my face, they are the ones that we need to thank each week and we are so grateful for them to help them keep us organized. We are also sponsored by Echo Factory, so we are grateful to them for their support as well. So this morning, we have a really exciting session. Matthew Ward is here with us this morning to talk us about Friday Coffee Meetup is for Closers. And we are going to talk a little bit about him and his experience in just a moment here. I do want to run through a few logistical things. Some of you might be seeing us this morning on LinkedIn Live. We are actually broadcasting through Zoom over to LinkedIn Live. And so our Q&A will be handled through the Zoom meeting. You are always welcome to join us on the Zoom meeting. The information is in the LinkedIn Live. You can join us over there and ask your questions. After Matthew speaks this morning, we will do a Q&A session. And that Q&A session is handled via the Q&A panel in the Zoom meeting. You might notice that we have our chat window open in the Zoom meeting. That is so you can feel free to say hello to one another and chat, but it is not moderated. So feel free to use the chat if you're attending on the Zoom, but please put your questions for Matthew into the Zoom Q&A at the bottom center of your screen. We'll hopefully get to everybody's questions today, but if we don't get to your question, you can feel free and also follow up with him after. So we are excited to have Matthew Ward of BCG here with us today. In this session of Friday Coffee Meetup is for Closers, he's gonna be talking about how the modern B2B go-to-market engine has changed across marketing, sales, and success, and how startups are actually taking down the giants with modern sales and marketing engines. Prior to BCG, he was more than 10 years with Everbridge, a SaaS startup that went to IPO. Um, he was there when it started around 30 people and he saw it all the way through IPO and that's now valued at over 5 billion. We are so pleased to have him here with us this morning. Please welcome Matthew. All right, hey everybody. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining us this morning and uh, thanks Christy, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to having this chat with everybody. Um, I'm going to pop up a couple slides and uh, and 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 just use this as, as kind of a, a way to talk through it here um, and go through some of the, the conversation. But um, hopefully, some of you have got the reference already around the coffee is for closers. If you don't know Glenn Gary and Glenn Ross, it's a classic movie, uh, classic sales related movie. Um, so my background is I've been doing sales my entire life in some form or another. Um, as, as Christy mentioned, I spent uh, you know, over 10 years at a startup, started when there's about employee, or employee number 30, all the way through IPO, stayed a couple years after that, um, and then since have been a partner and associate director at the Boston Consulting Group. Um, you know, and uh, what's, what's interesting in that time is, is you know, what I learned quite a bit you know, over the times, I didn't realize what we were doing and how we were building our go-to-market engine was that innovative. I didn't think it was that anything that special and what some of the things that we were doing it didn't seem, it just seemed normal, it just seemed like some of the things you had to do in order to, in order to win. Um, and over time, as, uh, you know, as I've transitioned into consulting, I'm now consulting for some of the world's largest companies um, and, and seeing how they are designed and seeing how they're structured, many of them are looking to how do we make those changes? How do we act more agile? How do we act more like some of the startups that are now kind of nipping at our heels, so to speak? And, uh, and so, so what, what I'm going to do is walk through kind of the, the, how the go-to-market uh, engine has, has changed, how our buyers have changed, 
and what people are doing and how people are structuring their businesses um, to actually meet those new buyer demands. Um, because uh, as you all know, and you've all experienced yourselves, you know, buying things have changed dramatically, um, even over the last five years, if not 10 years and beyond. And a lot of companies out there are still doing some of the same things that they've always been doing for the last 10 plus years. Um, and we'll talk about some of those things as we go through this. So, so for those of you that you know, are, are, are interested in go to market, that you're involved in these things, that you have your own startups, you're established businesses, I think there's gonna be something in this for everybody. And um, you know, looking, forward to, looking forward to the chat. And um, I'm gonna walk through these slides. I'm gonna move relatively quickly because I think you know, it's gonna be better when we get to the Q&A session. Um, but uh, definitely feel free to hold your questions and, and looking forward to the, the Q&A afterwards. So um, first thing I wanna do is, is talk about kind of how the, 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 the buyer has changed over the years, right? Um, you know, traditionally, the, the way the buying engine had worked is you had a little bit of marketing, you had a little bit of brand marketing communications that really just focuses on kind of the aware and interest component of things. But then you had this really big direct sales component. Um, and when you think about that, and everybody's stereotype when you think about sales is, I've got the salesman who's out on the golf course, whining and dining people and spending a lot of time with them. And, and you know, yeah, there are certain areas where that still exists, but for the most part, that's dying if not dead. Um, because the reality of it is, is the reason why I needed salespeople before is I needed them to educate me on the market. And I needed them to educate me on, on what their product does and other products like them. Um, whereas now, as things have shifted quite a bit, is there's a whole lot more emphasis on marketing and making people or, and driving people into that company. And there's a smaller component of sales, even though the sales and, mar and, the sales and marketing engines have gotten larger, there's a sweet spot where sales actually enters in. And, and the reason for that is, is, you know, think about how you all buy. Think about how you buy things today. You don't even go to a restaurant without looking at reviews, right? So we do the same thing whenever we're buying anything today. We, you know, think about buying a car. Before you had to go there and get educated on the cars and, get, and actually see them and feel them. And now you have so many experiences online. You can look at all the reviews. You can look at your pricing. You can do all that online. So it doesn't matter whether I'm buying something tangible a commodity, or whether I'm buying something, uh, a tech, a piece of technology, I can find reviews, I can find peers, I can do all my research. And for the most part, prior to ever even sit, engaging with a sales rep, 70% of the time, I've probably already made up my mind. I already know generally who I'm going with. And so, so it's, it becomes a much larger emphasis on inbound marketing and getting people and getting people through that research and evaluate stage. Um, and if your product involves demoing, even, even in some cases that. So, so you know, that's really one of the, the big changes that we're gonna talk about as we go through this. Um, and we'll talk about some of the other changes that are driving this as well. Um, but uh, you know, when we, you know, there's other components as well, we'll get into success. Um, but that's, you know, this is really one of the big emphasis is if you think about how buyers have changed and how we have all changed our buying. That's really the crux of all of this. So we as, as, as marketers, as salespeople, as success or service, we have to meet the buyer where they are and how they want to buy and where they are in their buying journey. And that's the, that's the critical part. Um, and so when you think about, um, you know, the, the, what's been driving this behind the scenes, not just how people have been changing themselves and their buying habit, but it's really that changes in technology and culture. So as I mentioned, the, the, the buyer behavior is, you know, I want, I want to be bought. I want to buy where I want to buy. I want that omni-channel experience. I want to be, some people prefer chat, some people prefer phone, some people prefer face to face. So, you know, it, it, the key is making sure that it's, an ex, it's a seamless experience, no matter which way that you're, you're entering and, and trying to be, uh, trying to get your information as a buyer. Um, the other big aspect is the shifting lens from revenue to lifetime value. So as people have been adap adapting different as a service models, I mean, you look at everything now, everything is a service, right? Um, in fact, you're starting to see this even in automotive where the technology in the automobiles is as a service. So you're having to pay monthly fees just to have those types of things. So no matter where you look, this model is, is increasing and whether you have a, a, a piece of technology or even a, 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 a tangible product, people are starting to look at the lifetime value of those customers. How much business and how much revenue and how much profit will they bring me over a lifetime and making business decisions around that because it's much more critical to keep those customers. It's a lot easier to keep and grow somebody than it is the land new. And so I'm really starting to look at the data and making sure I've got that 360 customer view. Um, 
And then as you think about how uh, operating models and how competition is changing, and this is again, the, the, the startups have really kind of pushed the envelope of this and really forced some of the giants to start making changes and, and making them changes even faster, is there's a lot lower barriers to entry in order to start businesses up. There's a lot lower barriers of entry to actually getting new, new, uh, new employees in different places. People are working from home, not just because of COVID, obviously that's exacerbated it, but um, be, be prior to COVID. You know, the, the ability to spin up new, in, new revenue generating engines has become so much easier. So the competition is increasing. So we're starting to see a massive shift in the operating models, which we'll discuss a bit as well. Um, and at the end of the day, all this is giving rise to that more modern go-to-market engine. So there's so much more data, there's so much more tools, um, you know, you name it, like in, 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 especially in a seller's, in, you know, in a seller's uh, tool chest or in their backpack, so to speak, you know, on average, there's more than 30 tools in their tech stack. So there's so many different ways to get information. There's so much information that's out there, but it, it, it becomes overload at some point. And we'll talk about that too. Um, but you think about the, the introduction of AI and ML powered pricing, next, next best action engines, analytics, et cetera. So there's a whole bunch more things that are, that are available to you. And we'll talk about that too, because as we go into it, it's a lot easier for a startup to start to build these things from the ground up versus an old entrenched player that has to kind of steer a, a, a gigantic tanker to try to get to those, to be able to do some of those things. So that's really what's kind of driving these things. As I mentioned, you know, COVID obviously has accelerated this need. Um, you know, I, I don't need to belabor the COVID point, but obviously, you know, especially in sales, anybody who used to be a face-to-face -face seller is now inside selling, right? So I, they have no choice. Everybody's an inside seller. Um, even with things op starting to open back up, you now look starting to look at, okay, did we really need to be doing that before? What are the things that we can keep? Um, but you know, either way, we're starting to see those shifts and starting to see that. And during COVID, again, the smaller, more agile companies were able to make these changes so much easier, so much quicker, um, whether it was you know, shifting from to more digital channels um, or whether it's shifting again to inside sales, they're a lot more agile. And, and frankly, those that, that, that um, took advantage of COVID are, even, are gaining even more market share because of that. And you're starting, again, you're seeing that in those smaller, more agile companies. Um, and so when we think about the go-to-market engine, you know, I really think of uh, the, the four core components and that's demand gen, sales development, we'll talk about what these are, core sales, and then the post-sale piece, which is, you know, a lot of times is now referred to as customer success. We'll talk about what that really means too. But from a demand gen standpoint, um, you know, if you're doing this right, you're really tracking customer engagement, you're trying to bring people in, you've got some automation and some personalization behind it. So it's not just the same old blasting tool that you get, the same old marketing uh, and you know, messaging that you get that goes into spam all the time. So how do, I, you know, how do I increase that? How do I get people coming to me and, and asking me for the information versus me constantly barraging people with emails? So there's so many new ways of doing demand gen. Um, and then connecting them. So the biggest thing though, is as we talked about how that, how that funnel has changed, since there's so much emphasis on that demand gen piece, when I, as a buyer, am ready and I have, you know, you know, at the end of the day, nobody wants to talk to a salesperson. I've learned, been learning that my entire career, my entire life. Nobody wants to talk to a salesperson. Even me as a salesperson, as a recovering salesaholic, uh, you know, even me as a salesperson, I don't even want to go talk to a salesperson um, when, uh, you know, when I'm buying something. So because of that, when you do have to speak to a sales rep and because you can't always get all the answers via, on, via online, and nor do we want to want people getting all their answers from, the, from a website because it doesn't really necessarily drive the value home and allow you to sell on value. Um, but when I do need to connect to that salespeople or to a human being, it has to be seamless. And so traditionally what you've seen, and you've probably all experienced this at some point or another, is when a lead comes in, you say, hey, I'm ready to buy, whether it's via chat, you filled out a form, I called into a number. It takes me years before if I ever get a call back from somebody. Um, but at that point, I am interested. I am doing my research. I'm on your website. I want to have this conversation. I want to have it on my terms and I want to have it now. So the introduction of a sales development team where there's a, almost a human, uh, human being that has entered in that, that, uh, that before it hits the, the core seller, um, they are helping marketing connect those dots and create that closed loop to make sure that things don't fall through the cracks and make sure that we are responding as quickly as possible to a buyer's needs. And so I'll talk a bit more about that as well in the next, uh, next slide. Um, and then once I've actually qualified somebody, uh, you know, because I want to make sure that 
we're having the right conversation, we're talking to the right people, that they actually are a buyer, that they're the right fit for, for us as a company. And we don't want to waste, you know, you also don't want to waste the buyer's time if it's not a right fit. So at that point, I then want to hand it off, or maybe not, I might keep it myself. Well, there's different options, um, but I'll hand it off to a core sales, do one of another, to another seller at that point, whether it's inside sales, field sales, et cetera. Um, but it's that seamless experience that I am being met uh, and being uh, being engaged throughout the process as a buyer the way that I want to be engaged. And then what's really kind of transitioned uh, a whole lot over the last five to 10 years is really the post-sale piece. And you know, the customer success is, is something that I think you, you many of you have probably heard before. It's, uh, it's still one of the newest capabilities in my mind that people are still trying to figure out what it really means. Is it a sales account management team? Or is it a services team, like, like a customer service team? Or is it something in between, right? And you know, as I mentioned before, is that life, that shift to lifetime value and looking at the, the entire lifetime uh, uh, potential revenue and profit you might get off of that customer, that post-sale process becomes even more important to make sure that I'm getting some massive retentions and upsides on, these, uh, on the post-sale aspect because I'm always landing, I'm always expanding, I'm cross-selling, I'm upselling. And so what do those components actually look like and, that, and how do we actually engage those, those uh, our buyers on an ongoing basis? Now, obviously you see some stats on this slide. Uh, these stats are really just the tip of the iceberg. We've seen so much larger uh, you know, increases in conversions. We've seen increase in productivity, especially if you're a more smaller and agile company, these numbers are low, right? When you start to integrate and start to do different things and add new capabilities to those teams, you're seeing 100% plus improvement in productivity. Um, so, uh, so we'll talk about some of that as we get into this as well. Um, and so when you think about what do those teams, like and kind of put it visually, like how does this all work? So you, know, you, you, know, you, you typically have those four key customer facing functions. You've got that marketing demand gen engine, you know, that trap, you know, you're going to the inbound, you're going to the websites, you're, on the, you're getting nurtured, you're getting email, you've got a marketing automation platform that hopefully is doing some ideal customer profiles, buyer personas, lead scoring, the right content at the right time. And then once I finally have that marketing qualified lead, so to speak, I either send it directly to a seller or I've got that intermediate sales development team to make sure that I am being as responsive as possible because in many cases, it's the first mover. So if I'm looking, in, in looking at multiple things um, and I'm, I've got a lot of competition with whatever I'm selling, where do you think they're going to go? They're going to, people are going to buy to the people who are most responsive and gets them the answers the quickest. So that's another reason why these types of teams exist. Uh, and that's a relatively new term um, around sales. But you may have heard sales development representatives, business development representatives. And even though business development used to mean something different, it's now essentially your modern day, you know, telemarketers slash cold callers that are armed with a whole lot more technology and armed with a whole lot more data and a lot more skill set than what your traditional call centers would have been in the past. Um, and then depending on the type of business you are, if I'm a highly transactional business, that may be the seller. They may just close it down, right? If I'm a transactional business where it's a one call close, I don't wanna hand it off to a seller, right? I need, to, I need to have a great customer experience. I may close it down right there on the spot. But when you have more complex sales, that's when you then decide, okay, who am I handing this off to? Am I handing it to a partner? Am I handing it to field sales? Am I handing it to an inside sales program? Um, and so that's really the, the key decisions as you think about growing your business or, or, you know, uh, um, or, or changing things around is what does this process look like? But more importantly, behind the scenes, what does the buyer experience actually look like? Um, then once you get to the post-sale component, all right, well, now I want to start to really leverage analytics, churn data, cross-sell and upsell analytics. So whether you're selling technology or whether you're selling, a, again, a tangible good, um, if I'm a tangible good, like technology, everybody thinks like, let's talk about technology. And that's what the most of the information that you see that's out there. Um, and but on either in other areas like industrial goods, like some of the other areas that are, are you know, not as much information on and they're a little bit further behind, um, there's a lot to be learned there. So imagine that you're a buyer of something and uh, you know, you're constantly reordering, but then a reorder is missed a month. As a sales rep or as an account manager, I'd wanna know that, right? I want that, I want the entire system integrated. So I want to know when that happens. And I want that flag to me because to me, that's something that doesn't sound right. And so I might have some churn problems that I might have some competition problems as well. So, um, so those are the types of things that we're talking about and we'll get deeper into it. Now, 
when you think about these, the, the shift in coverage model, and again, this is something that, again, startups and uh, that, you know, companies that are just getting off the ground that are smaller, more agile, they're investing a whole lot more into these two core components, which is really the lead gen demand center piece that we talked about, and also inside sales. And so when you think about um, the, way, uh, the way people are structured in coverage models, traditionally, you would have seen a whole lot more field sales here, right? And so much more little inside sales. And inside sales, frankly, was looked at as a lesser component or not as skilled of a, a role. And in fact, that, that has completely flipped in my mind. Um, and now what you're starting to see is you're starting to see inside sales go higher and higher up the segmentation and be able to sell larger and larger accounts. Um, I was actually talking to a, a very large uh, customer the other day who they actually had a billion dollar deal closed purely inside having never seen somebody. So like this is real, people are used to it. Um, we're as buyers, we're used to it, especially now during COVID, we're all used to you know, the, the digital engagement and we're used to doing things. Unfortunately, we're used to doing things over Zoom all the time. Um, so, uh, so the ability and people are a lot more receptive to ever than, than before. So pressuring that and pushing that and really kind of pushing that inside sales further and further up, up market is something that we're seeing more and more within companies and you see it more and more within um, within startups, primarily because of uh, primarily because of necessity, right? Because I need to cover a whole lot more ground. I've got less resources, so I need to do a lot more with less. And so, for those of our clients that have actually made the made the transition from inside sales, is you you know it, it, it's they've seen some massive cost reduction. But when you start out that way and you build your and design your go to market engine that way from the beginning. You're immediately seeing that, you know, seeing the fruits of your labor and seeing the the uh, the profit and the return on that investment right from the beginning. So not only the fact that is it cheaper to do inside sales, but a whole lot more productive. Um, I work a lot with field selling organizations where I have traditional field sellers that are going door to door, so to speak. That I'm constantly out in the field. You know, think um, even medical device, think pharma, where I have to go visit uh, a physician. And starting to even rethink that is like, do you have to? Do they actually want you coming in and interrupting their day, so to speak, right? Do they need that information? Or is it something that I can, I can be more productive? I can have 10x the amount of contacts to that individual and give them a better, a better service without having to go visit them face to face because that drive time, that field time is a massive drain on productivity. So so I'm not saying that field sales is dead by any means, um, because there's always going to be a need in many cases, especially for certain businesses, that that face-to-face -face is needed. But as you think about your business or the industry that you're in or the you know what you're focused on, always be thinking about pushing that envelope to go higher and higher and really test the market, understand your customers and see what they want and see how they want to buy and build your team with that in mind. And uh, so... So that's something that's really, really important as you go into this. Now, when we think about, uh, you know, the, really the, the whole entire model um, and, and how this, you know, how the entire buying process goes, uh, there's been quite a few changes that, again, that have gone over the years. Um, we talked about the funnel, but we look at it in kind of the, again, it's the traditional learn by use or marketing sales and, and, and post sales. Um, but there are certain steps along each customer journey, and, and it's really important to map those things out based on your customer journey and make sure you understand what is happening at each, happening at each stage. Because it's not just one stage I need to focus on. It's not just sales. It's not just marketing. It's not just success. And there are micro areas in each one. There's different steps within each one that I need to focus on. And I'm going to show you a very ugly slide. Um, it's, in, it's an insane amount of data on here, but it's really about what am I going to do? What are some of the new things that I am doing across the board? And what are some of the more advanced things that I'm doing? And again, um, startups and, and more smaller companies have the ability to do this from the ground up. And they have the ability to do more things like omni-channel engagement. They have the ability to do different things around um, personalization and scoring and routing and tracking and looking at the data, um, you know, looking at data-driven segmentation and coverage models and quotas. Because over time, the larger entrenched players have grown to behemoths, be behemoths over different things of M&A. They've organically grown. But every time there's somebody new that comes on board or a new company they acquired, there's a massive amount of integration problems, um, whether it's the human capital integration or the technology integration 
And the smaller companies that are able to do that are able to do a lot of these tech-driven and data-driven things um, that, are on, uh, that are on these different components. They're able to do it a whole lot easier because they're being built as a technology company from the ground up, right? Everybody should, everybody's a technology company now. And so, but the question is, if I was established that from the beginning, it's a lot easier to connect this from end to end and be able to see my end to end funnel without having to see all these disjointed or disconnected systems that are out there. Um, and so as a smaller, more agile company, I have the ability to build that from the beginning for those large companies that are out there. That's what I'm spending my time doing now, right? Is I'm spending my time going back and saying, how can I fix this? How can I get to these points? How can I get to these little areas here? that are giving me these next level, that are giving me conversational intelligence where I'm actually looking at the data and I'm looking at what our customers are saying, how many times my competitors are mentioned, how many times certain features are mentioned, um, how many times uh, my rep says uh, a certain phrase that seems to resonate and change the sentiment of the conversation. You know, So there's some really cool things. It's not all about the most fancy AI and, and ML that's out there, in fact, um, much of that is only really good if you have kind of the basics and the underlying infrastructure to begin uh, to begin with. So it's not always about that, but it's really about the underlying process that is the most important thing and making sure all of these components is a well-oiled machine and very well connected. Um, now, the biggest question is, uh, you know, of course, how do I do all of that? Because these are all different humans, they're all different components, and typically marketing sales and success are in silos, especially marketing and sales. You know, I always look at it as like a therapy session because it's, you know, marketing is a silo, sales is a silo, and it's like brother and sister and they're constantly finger pointing. And then sales is saying, you know, give me more leads and marketing is saying, do something with the leads that I actually send you. And then sales says, well, your leads are garbage. And then they say, well, prove it to me because I don't, you've only called them once. And then you said it was no good and they didn't answer. So like, there's that constant fighting and that constant infighting. So they're, you know, the, the key is how do I break down those silos? And what we are seeing is, is a massive element of that is the rise of operations, strategy, and analytics becoming a much, much larger role. Gone are the days of my sales ops people and my marketing operations people just being reporting jockeys, right? That, that, that's kind of, unfortunately, that's been the mentality over the years of what other people think about. And now it's a real strategic function that can actually help the organization move in a different way and strategy should be sitting within those functions. And, you know, we see different clients and, you know, they're, everybody's struggling across the board. They're struggling to try to do these things. And because there's misaligned incentives, because they're not well connected, um, there really isn't that trust. Uh, there really isn't that way to track the pipeline from end to end. And so how do I actually do that? And so we are starting to see the rise of revenue operations we're seeing that and, and RevOps is even up to this point is in some cases is people have just rephrase that as it's really set, it's still sales ops. It's not even marketing ops. They're not integrated. It doesn't mean you need to integrate all, fun, all components of them, but there are certain components that absolutely should be integrated. It's one way to bring them together. doesn't mean you have to, if you're already tightly aligned, if you're already engaged and you already have the SLAs, you already have the, the KPIs to share. doesn't mean you have to do these things, but this is one way that we're starting to see those organiza organizations start to drive the value. And so if you're able to build this from the ground up and build it as one team to where we aren't at odds with each other, um, it makes such a huge difference. And this is just one example of it, um, where typically you would have that decentralized organization, those silos with marketing sales and success or services. And now I wanna bring them all under one umbrella. Again, it depends on the business, depends on where you are, um, but you can, you can do it in different components. You can move it, you know, you bring in the things that are most important to you that'll help you drive the most for your business. So it depends on, you know, where you are um, in your maturity as well. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I'm going to wrap up here. But at the end of the day, you know, as you think about the, the key success factors um, that you're going through and whether you are a startup yourself um, or whether you're a very established company, um, you know, you need to be keeping these types of concept and, and being weighing the pros and cons and really be looking at these operations teams as strategy and strategy needs to be a key component of what you're doing. Now, early on, obviously you wanna sell, 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 but over time you need to actually start to transition to say, all right, well, my leaders can't just be really good salespeople. I need people that can actually think about the broader picture, think about the strategy, think about how we connect our operations underneath 
Um, and so you need that strong leader with the cross-functional experience. And frankly, there's always going to be the people there that are just going to say, I've always done it this way, or I've did it, I did it this way in the past, and it's going to work this way. You have to be willing to, to move people and, 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 and make sure you've got the right, the right talent on board and the people who are open to it and, and have that, that go forward mentality to try new things and fail. Um, you have to be thinking about um, rewiring and streamlining that process. And that's a constant job. That's not just a one-time thing. You need to be constantly thinking about how can I prove this? How can I improve my processes to improve the buyer experience? Um, thinking about your tech stack. Uh, I know everybody thinks tech is the answer and, and many of you may be uh, tech companies and, and sales tech companies, um, but in, in the, in the go-to-market stack, they're enablers, right? I got to have my process. I got to have my people and the tech can only accelerate that, right? So I want to make sure that I get those things right and think about that tech stack and how all that integrates. Um, and then over time, thinking about building, how do I continue to, to diagnose? How do I continue to do uh, improvement and do continuous improvement over time? So so anyway, so I know I went through a whole lot really quick there and, uh, you know, it's a good a mixture of, you know, looking at it from startup to, uh, to established company, but everybody's looking at these concepts. Some of you are probably already doing these things naturally, um, but you really need to start to think about how do I systematize these things in order to grow and how do I make these things faster and I can accelerate and I can scale faster. And so uh, that's how you're going to take down, if you're a startup, that's how you're going to take down the big entrenched folks. And if you're an entrenched one, then this is the types of things you need to be thinking about in order to actually transition your organization to get to that next level, to be able to stay competitive. So I'll stop there, Christy, and uh, hopefully it wasn't too fast and too overwhelming, but uh, hopefully that was valuable. That was amazing. I'm looking forward to going back and re-watching kind of the video and the LinkedIn Live again. Those were fantastic slides that gave me a lot to think about. Um, and I love this last one as well, just, as a reminder, right, that it's applicable for both startups and those big entrenched companies. Um, so if you are on the Zoom and you would like to ask a question, go ahead and put that in the Q&A panel at the bottom center of the screen. Um, we have a question to kick us off. In your opinion, since sales ops slash uh, revenue ops report to sales or finance, and what are the pros and cons of each? That's a good question. So. Again, revenue ops is something that is still relatively new. It all depends on what you actually consider revenue operations. So um, as an example, like when we did the, the, this, uh, this data here is a relatively small survey, but it's 26 of some of the largest companies in the world where we spoke to their top level executives. And each time we spoke to them, it was something a little bit different. So I'll think about one of, for example, one of the largest SaaS companies that are out there, um, their revenue operations is actually less sales and marketing and more finance focused, meaning they're more quote to cash. So I've got a quote that comes in the door. How do I actually process that quote? How do I then do all the technology underneath there? Um, so if that's the case, you might see revenue operations reporting to finance. Um, but if more times than not, the more modern revenue operations you're seeing, it involves marketing and sales. So if it is focused on those areas and depending on the depth of which you go within your rev ops, if it is again traditionally more of a sales ops organization, you're going to see it reporting up through that structure. Now, that's also why you start to see modern day CROs, which is more of like your, your more go-to-market focused focus COO. And the CRO is a chief revenue operate, uh, a chief revenue officer. And they're really, again, more operational drivers where they own, they in most cases, they're going to own more than just sales. They're going to own sales and marketing and, and maybe even success or services. So it just depends on what people own and what those operations are supporting to decide where I need to focus and where it should be plugged in and, and where it makes sense. Because at the end of the day, if I've got marketing and sales under one umbrella, I'm always going to need a tiebreaker, right? Uh, because that, that problem isn't going away anytime soon. That, that, you know, that, that polarization isn't going away anytime soon. Um, so, uh, so that, you know, I hope, hopefully that helps. That does help. Um, our next question, what do you see the role of brands and traditional marketing or where do you see the role of brands in traditional marketing? So with brand and traditional marketing, like when we think about demand centers and building that, cause that it's all under one umbrella, right? Traditionally brand and corporate communications is something that sit outside, right? And that, and they've been something that's either on their own. Um, in fact, I, I was working with a very large client where they just hired their first CMO that in this company's 
you know, multi-billion dollar company, right? They just hired their first CMO. And so that's something that as uh, prior to that, they just had brand and corporate communication. They weren't focused on getting people to come to them. They weren't focused on getting people to come inbound, but they had a crazy powerful brand. Everybody knows who they are in this industry, right? So, but that's when we need to then team together and make sure that whatever that, that, traditional, that traditional brand and, and corporate marketing, um, and they need to come together to really figure out together with demand gen, how do I utilize that, that brand and that strategy and that power of what we're doing on that side to drive people inbound? Right. Because traditional brand is more outbound. It's more like, hey, let me get my name out there. Let me make sure people know who we are. But inbound is I want people coming to me and saying, I'm actually interested in your services. I want to buy. Connect me with somebody or go straight to e-commerce and I want to buy something right online. So you really have to work together to make sure that that they're integrated and that they're working together and that they're not in silos um, across the go to market engine. You can't, it's like, you're going to lose every time if you're in silos, if you don't have a team that works well together and you aren't integrated at the hip, you don't have shared KPIs, you don't have shared incentives. You have to have those things in order to continue to, to scale and continue to move faster and beat your competition. I think, you know, everybody struggles with silos across organizations, big and small. Do you have you seen anything that's particularly effective to get people kind of joining hands and working across those silos? Well, the so the revenue operations function was almost born out of that because it was born out of that necessity. How do I pull people together? How do I force it? Right? How do I force it under one roof to where now you have to work together and it's owned by one person who is that tiebreaker? Now, you don't see that everywhere, um, and that's always that's not always needed. Um, but the way to do that is with those incentives, right? Is you have to have the shared incentives. So as an example, um, it's not just about marketing saying, hey, I've created X amount of MQLs and I've created all these leads for, for salespeople. Um, and, and, and sales saying, okay, well, I've closed a bunch of business and I didn't use marketing for help for that. Then the, the natural reaction is, is like, that's not true ever, right? We're in this together. And so every time I have a handoff of information, I want to make sure that I have a shared incentive in place, that anytime I, ha I hand that off, that we both have shared incentives that say, if I'm going to create this MQL, I'm going to spend the money to get you this quality lead. I expect you to respond within a certain amount of time. I expect you to respond with a certain amount of follow through. So one or two attempts on an inbound lead isn't going to do it. Right, that doesn't do enough. In fact, on average, it takes anywhere probably between five and 12 attempts just to get somebody on the phone who asked for something, right? So that's how important it is that we have the shared incentive. So if I hand something off to, to, to sales, I expect you to follow through. And the only way we get better together is I need that feed, feedback loop. I need to know that you did that and I need to incentivize you on that. And only then when you say it's disqualified, can I then improve my engine to get it better? Because we don't we don't improve without integrating them. So to your point, Christy, is a long answer. It's shared incentives um, to make sure that uh, that no matter what we are doing, is we're driving the right types of behavior, so we both get the information we need, and the entire engine improves. Great. What are the applications to B two C companies, and how does it apply? You know, any differences or similarities? Um, yeah, it's uh, so B two C is is is. I mean, obviously, the, there's quite a few similarities. Um, the difference being is depending on the B2C organization that you're a part of, you may not have a human being involved in selling, or you might. So um, you have to take those things into account. So B2C, you typically see way to hop a lot more towards e-commerce. Um, but I will tell you, for example, uh, some older industries, like think about building materials, think about windows and doors and selling those types of things. Um, Interestingly enough, I've, done, I've recently done some research on, on those industries where uh, the ones that are building themselves up from the ground up are completely changing how these things are done. Um, so they're completely changing their underlying uh, business processes, their operations to where marketing and sales are so well integrated that by the time I need somebody to go in home, that they are dialed in. I'm, I've got the best rep that are lined up with the right types of leads that are the right opportunities that are the in-home sales. In fact, I've recently experienced this myself, like trying to buy new windows uh, to where I've got a company who, who is new and has built those operations and is a seamless experience all the way through, all the way down to, I went on Yelp 
And uh, I found the, one of the best folks on Yelp and I reached out to them and then it takes days, weeks for somebody to respond. Somebody eventually comes to my house. It's not a real process. Marketing and sales is not integrated. They don't know anything about me. So the key to that is making sure that it's integrated. And you think about Starbucks, Starbucks is personalization app. Like they know everything about you, right? And they know about you. They know what you're and They know when you stop coming. So now I'm going to pepper you with it. Hey, an offer that says, come on back um, or bring a friend. Here's a friend that get a discount. Like you're a tea person, you're a coffee person. So all of those things are seamlessly integrated between marketing and sales. So that way I'm driving that, that front of the house operations too. When you come in store, they know about you as an individual as well. Um, so it's the same type of concepts because I'm, I'm really looking at it from the buyers. How does my buyer journey change? Um, and then making sure I build my underlying processes and technology stack to support that. Um, are you seeing any, like in innovation perspectives around technologies, are you seeing any AR or VR that's going to be coming in this area? Yeah, we, we already have started to see some of these things. Um, we actually uh, work with a, we have a company named uh, Magic Beat that does some of this stuff, but uh, we're starting to see more virtual showrooms. Um, so like rather than having a physical showroom, I've got a virtual showroom that I, if you've got a VR headset, you can actually go in and explore. Um, we were talking to a, a, a large manufacturer the other day where they actually have to show the technology, right? Show the robotics that they're selling. How do you do that? I can't take a robot and take it someplace and show it to you. And I may not want to ask that individual who's going to buy to fly all the way over international and fly to Japan to show this, you know, to show off this new robotics engine. So giving them that VR and that virtual, uh, that virtual reality where they can actually see it live and see it interacting and working. Um, and worst case scenario is I can do it over Zoom, right? Even that, like the, it blew people's minds before is like, I, I, I have to have them come. And don't get me wrong, that face-to-face -face interaction is still very important and it still is a, is, is a big key, especially to closing that type of deal where you're selling a big robotics engine. But I can qualify, I can do a lot more conversations. I don't have to have them come out every time. I don't have to have them fly across the world or, or pay for them to come out. I can do more things around VR um, and I can do more things around just general Zooms and FaceTimes that you wouldn't have thought about before, even before COVID. Um, but yeah, we are seeing, uh, we're seeing more of that around, especially around virtual showrooms where you're trying to show off a product that's not easy to bring to you and not easy to send samples. Um, so we're starting to see it in those, in those worlds as well. Um, so any way that you can engage with your customer in a different way, in a unique way is something that's net positive. Great. Does user experience design play a big part in these types of strategies? So um, when we say user experience, um, is, is it from a buying or a product standpoint? I would say in a, they didn't indicate in the question, but I would say from a, a buying perspective, it, have you seen any kind of user experience design that's been helpful in, in that selling perspective? Yeah, well, and it's, you know, it's, there's definitely a lot of different uh, UX, especially whether you're, you're building the buying experience or even the product experience. There's a lot of, a lot of new tools that are out there around how, what are people clicking on? Uh, what was interesting is using the mouse tracker. So if I start to go towards that X button, like have a pop-up, right? So you're seeing different things about how people are doing it, how you're tracking it, tracking where people's eyes move. The mobile experience is really where the explosion has come into play because a lot of buying, a lot of research is now done mobily. So the user experience for that is where you're seeing a lot more investment um, uh, and, and in terms of getting people to, and how, how I'm gonna do this on, on mobile and how do I engage people most on mobile? Um, so I, we see a lot in those, in those worlds, but nothing in my opinion is still better than getting on the ground and working with your customers and a lot of your customers and doing those secret shopping. Like, you will get so much more value just to learn with them rather than hiring somebody who's done it before. You still have to go learn from your customers. You still have to figure out what are they doing? Tell me about why you did this, whether I'm even a seller, like why did you click that? Like, tell me like, okay, you may have these tools, but why are you doing that? Well, it's a workaround because I can't get the information here and I got to come here. So that will tell you a whole lot more than just going in and, and buying some tool or buying or paying for somebody to come in and say, I've got this great experience. Those things are great, 
but I need to have the customer feedback. I need to be doing that and I need to be doing it constantly, whether it's the buying experience or the user experience of your products. Wonderful. Um, where would you start or focus on as a one person B2B company that sells video content as a service? In the past, they would do this face to face. So you said a one person? Yes, like a one person B2B company around video content as a service. So, and if you traditionally did this face to face, I'm not saying stop that. Because um, I, I don't, to be honest with you, I don't know that space that well. Um, but what I will say is really diving deep to understand what parts of your sales process can you do remotely? So as an example, uh, like if I took a, a company like a, a medical device company who I am going face to face is that I do have to eventually because I probably have to teach somebody how to implant or I got to teach somebody how to do something. So that face to face is absolutely going to be required. However, there's a whole process prior to that that could be potentially done remotely. And so if you're thinking about a one, to, especially a one person company, you have to be efficient. You have to be about productivity. And so you can't be everywhere. That's the one thing you can't scale is your ability to be in front of people face to face. What you can scale is your ability to be in front of people face to face remotely. And so that's something that you really need to focus on is figure out and, and making sure that whatever you are doing, when you do, and if you need to go face to face, that it is so qualified that you are not going to be wasting your time when you do that. Um, so that's really the key is making sure that you've got your process dialed in. You've answered all of your questions and it's not getting the typical salesperson happy ears where somebody said they're interested. I got to go visit them face to face. It's like, no, I actually need to go much deeper in my qualification. I need to ask them the buying questions. I need to go deeper. I need to figure out the timing. I need to figure out the pain that I'm solving for them and not just somebody said they're interested. Uh, and that's the hardest part, especially as a small business and a new business, is anytime somebody says, that's really cool, I'm interested, let's talk about it, come visit me, I immediately jump and say, I'm in, I'm going. Um, but you need to take a step back and make sure that you don't immediately jump, ask the questions, ask if, hey, why don't we do the first call remotely? Because um, it's faster, we can do it now, let's do it right now. Um, why do we need to why do we need to set up an appointment to see face to face because there's an opportunity you might be able to close it without ever even going face to face. So you really have to do some kind of introspection to say where in my sales process is appropriate. Can I ask these questions and can I do more things remotely in order to scale and be able to get to more people rather than going face to face all the time. Great. And that's by the way, that's clear, regardless of whether you're a one person business or whether you're a right. field seller who's been doing it for 30 years. You need to be rethinking that because what I will tell you is that if you are that person who, and in, in many cases, I've been that person where I'm going to visit somebody face to face just for the sake of activity, because I feel like that's the right thing to do. In fact, I didn't even ask the client if that's really what they prefer. I assume that that's what they prefer because that's what they've always experienced as well. So ask them, push the, push the envelope, make sure you're doing those things because if you're not, your competitors are going to, and you're eventually going to start losing. So, uh, you know, we, ha we all have to be changing. We can't be selling the same way we did 10 years ago or even five years ago. Sorry, sorry, Christine. I like that. No, no, it's good. And I like that focus on productivity. I think for all of us, right? We sometimes jump to action very quickly, but thinking back about, okay, what is going to be the most effective thing that we're doing, even if it doesn't feel like you're doing the activity. Um, you talked about this a little bit uh, already during the presentation, but what do you see as a typical mix of demand gen versus selling in B2B in terms of cost and time? Oh, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, and, and it's not, and I'm going to give you the typical consultant answer that it depends. Um, and it really depends on the, the buying process. Uh, and I know I've been saying that throughout the entire, the entire time, but what I mean by that is, am I selling a product that has an e-commerce aspect to it? Am I selling a complex product that needs to be demoed, that needs to be piloted, that needs sales engineers? So depending on that, you're going to see a shift in that, right? So if I need, in some cases, I may have a product that um, I don't need a human seller at all, or I don't need face-to-face -face sellers at all, or I'm doing everything completely e-commerce. So in that point, if it's that, then obviously I'm shifting more of my cost towards the marketing piece and the demand gen piece, and I'm heavily weighted there. Um, and then 
What's also interesting is even in that case, then you want to think about the lifetime value of the customer. So what am I doing post-sale? So don't think about marketing and sales just as landing the accounts. You also have to be thinking about the post-sale process. So don't lose track of that because it's a lot easier to keep and expand customers and grow them than it is to land new. So part of that marketing, um, even if it's all e-commerce, part of that marketing needs to be also focusing on your existing customers. So you may need to ratchet the cost of that up even more. And it's less about the demand of getting new people in, but how am I delivering the right content to get cross-sell and upsell and, and people to retain? So versus if I am a heavily weighted technical product where I need to do demos, it's a long complex sales cycle um, where I'm focusing on certain segments that are just large segments. I'm only focusing on enterprise. Um, marketing might be less of important demand gen, but then I'm shifting marketing to be more account-based marketing. I'm doing more account-based things and more targeting. So I may not be spending as much as I would if I was on the opposite side that I just spoke about, but I'm spending a lot more now in sales because of my complex sales process. And I need a lot more people um, in that regard. So I know that wasn't a, a numbers answer to your question. It's more of what are you selling? And then you have to shift the costs associated with it. Right. And, you know, we're seeing a lot of shifts in the selling process that you've talked about throughout the pandemic. And do you see, do you think we're going to continue on that path? Do you think there's going to be any boomerang, like bringing us back to more in person or things, other changes that you're going to see in the selling process? What else are you, are you thinking about for future, either both ways, continuing in a trajectory that keeps going in this path, or do you think there'll be like any turnaround? Um, well, with regards to how the, the selling process has changed, and in, in particular, like field sales versus inside sales, right? Let's talk about the big elephant first, right? And that in itself, if what this didn't teach you, and if you didn't learn inside skills, like as an example, um, you're a typical field seller and all you're armed with is a laptop. And now I'm inside. And I think anybody who's done work and if you've been sitting inside, if you don't have dual monitors, for example, you don't have headsets or I've got like a job or speaker here, not a, not a plug for job, by the way. Um, but, uh, you know, I've, I've got like I've got my setup to do things remotely. Um, if you aren't thinking about those things and even from a hardware standpoint, then when you think about the software, like how am I going to manage my reps remotely, whereas I typically would have rode along with them. Like if you haven't then start, if you haven't already figured out new things that were missing in your life, you're missing the boat. Because what I will tell you is those things are not going away um, because your competitors did learn about it and now they are shifting. And so the things that are staying is inside sales is growing and the ability to do things more remotely is growing. And what I would say is, is that, that does, again, it doesn't mean all field sales is dead, but the concept of I am an outside seller is. And what I mean by that is it should be reversed where I'm saying my mantra is inside sales. I can be more productive. I can provide a better customer experience by doing more things inside and choosing the right activities and choosing the right time to go outside. Whether it's me personally and my productivity, or again, whether it's my customer's experience, when we've evaluated uh, different, uh, different customers, even those physicians, you and you actually ask them like, hey, do you want those, that visit face to face? They like, actually, I'd prefer that they're more proactive on my orders, right? Tell me when I'm delayed. Tell me when these things, I don't want to have to call your customer service every time. I'd rather you do that than drop in and buy, and buy me lunch or buy me dinner. So like that type of thing, that mantra needs to shift. And that is not going away. Um, what I will say, though, in terms of what's, you know, what, I, what you do see is coming back is just the, the need and desire to want to get out to me face to face again, right? Just because we've all been cooped up. I know I've been sitting in this room for we talked about earlier, Christy, like 370 days, I think. So like, I have not left, like I haven't been in an office. Um, and so I'm looking forward to that, but I am sitting there gonna, I'm still gonna take a step back and say, well, I traveled a lot before. And even in our world as consulting, where we are the most well, you know, we travel more than anybody probably in, across any industry. Um, we're now taking a step back and saying, we're not going back, right? We're not going back to the same typical Monday through Thursday type of scenario. We need to be more targeted because again, it's about the customer experience and can we be better? And, you know, and, and there's gonna be cases where we need to be face-to-face, -face, sure. Um, and, that, and, there's, you know, and there's a lot of those things that aren't going away, but how much more productive is it a better customer experience to do inside? 
And so that's the mantra. And that's what you need to keep telling yourself is I need to make better decisions at the end of the day. And that's not going away. On that, you know, for reskilling, any tips on, you know, we have different generational gaps, you know, technology is different for different generations. Anything on reskilling to just help make that mind shift? Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, and uh, it's a very good question because we, we spent a lot of time on that, right? So um, what I would say is even if you're, even if you, you don't have the technology background, like CRM, obviously, and sales and marketing automation platforms, like, well, CRM is a whole nother topic, right? Because we, like, in most cases, many people have access to CRM now, whether you use it or not is a different case. And whether you know how to use it or not is a, is, is a different story. But the constant evaluation whether I know technology or not, um, I need to be thinking about how I do things more digital and I have to be transitioning. And even, even if it's taking baby steps to, I need to get off of my black notebook to getting things in an Excel and then Excel to CRM, like where, what is that transition? But I need to be thinking about how can I be more digital in my business and how do I make those transitions and, and what value does that bring to my clients? So as an example, um, you know, a lot of people run their businesses by going through their phone book and saying, oh, I haven't talked to that customer in a long time. I should check back in with them. And then I call them up. And, and then, by the way, this happened a lot during COVID was I'm at home now. What am I going to do? I'm not on the road. So I'm going to flip through my phone book and realize that I haven't spoken to this customer in a long time. And then I call them up and, hey, I got an order. Well, what would have happened if you had done that six months ago, if you have digitized your process? to actually know when to call them, even if it's basic Excel that says, I last contacted them on in January. Well, my next contact is I wanna call them in February. So like making sure things don't fall through the cracks. So you don't have to know all the technology, even if you've been selling for 40 years, but I do need to be thinking about how do I make sure I digitize my process to the extent that I know, and then constantly be kind of look for the next thing, look for the training, there's all sorts of free training that's out there. Um, look to colleagues to teach you um, because anybody who does it and, uh, and, and who people are always willing to tell that, uh, about the cool hacks that they're doing. So find those individuals that are doing things different and share information because even if you've been selling for a long time, you have a ton of value that you're going to be able to instill, instill on the young buck, so to speak, right? That, that's doing everything digitally, but doesn't know how to ask the right questions, doesn't know how to create a relationship where you do. So share that information, find those mentors and mentees that you can actually work with um, to help you get to that next step. I love that kind of an idea about a matching program it's, between it, them. It, that could be interesting. It works. The buddy program yeah. works, right? No matter what business you're in, no matter whether you're a seller or anything else, the buddy program works, but you got to pair the right buddies. Right. Right. I think we'll do one more question, then I'll open it up to you. Um, we had a lot of questions today. We are going to have open networking today, but we have put um, Matthew's information into the chat window so you can follow okay. him there. there. Um, how is Alexa Google Hub voice in car going to influence sales? <laughs> um, there's actually entire businesses uh, that are entire VC funds that are also focused just on voice. Um, now, one aspect is obviously the information they're collecting and the data they're collecting. Now, I, I have I have Alexa all over my house. Not a plug for Alexa, um, but I, I, I ha and, and I know she's listening and I know she's collecting data. And I'm just going to deal with that fact and that they're using it because every time I log into Amazon, it's like they're telling me exactly what I just listened to. Like even Google, like everybody's listening. So, so from that aspect is um, the data that you are collecting through those types of, uh, of, of voice capture is one aspect, like how can you actually leverage that? Um, and where can you get access to some of that data? So, you know, whereas traditionally you've had, you know, the market research firms where they're sending that out to get the information for you, to get the demographic information, get your buyer personas and profiles. Um, but now there's other data providers that are gonna be able to provide that information to you. For how much longer? I don't know how that's gonna work, but, um, Figuring out what, but the, the, the problem is, is data overload. And regardless of whether you're using a voice platform or not, data overload becomes a very big issue and tech debt becomes an issue. But understanding what is the important data that you need out of these types of tools. Um, 
Now, that's just the data aspect. Voice capture as a whole has opened up uh, a whole new industry around conversational intelligence. Um, and uh, around how do I capture and how do I even provide reps real-time feedback, whether it's a customer service rep or whether it's a salesperson, how am I providing that real-time feedback, that sentiment analysis that's helping them ask the right questions, capturing the right data. So that way I, you know, like right now I could be using a tool that is capturing all of this, this conversation and capturing who asked what question, what was the sentiment, um, who mentioned what competitors and give me that entire script and give me my follow-ups as a sales rep, because normally we're feverishly writing and we miss things. This gives me the ability to go back and look at those things. So I don't know if that completely answered the question, but there's a lot of different things that voice is, and, and voice captures is doing for us. And the ability to listen um, and uh, do that sentiment analysis as well is becoming bigger and bigger. So you're only going to see more and more of it. Thank you. Um, for uh, We've gotten a few questions around the video. I did put... Uh, my LinkedIn live in uh, or LinkedIn in the um, in the chat session. I also uh, it will also be eventually available on our YouTube channel, um, and I'm putting that in the chat session as well. But for now, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn live, we've been broadcasting live this whole time. You'll be able to rewatch it there on LinkedIn, so that is an option. Um, Matthew, anything else that you would like to update us with, or did this bring up any other questions that you think it would be important to um, share with everyone before we wrap up today? Yeah, no. Um, well, what's uh, we've just been doing a lot of research with the Association of Inside Sales, um, and uh, and so we've been doing a lot of research around uh, what are the types of things people are doing, what are the types of technology sellers are using. So you can go to our website, BCG, look for our, our um, marketing sales insights uh, and check out my LinkedIn, follow me. You'll see a new post coming out specifically around CRM. There's some past ones around technology. So there's a ton of information available out there. Um, and, uh, and, and so I would just check those areas, uh, those two areas out. Um, and uh, because we're doing a lot of surveys of very large companies. So if you're small or if you're large and you want to understand what they're thinking about to either use to help further your own stuff within your own organization or think about what they are, you know, the problems they're having. And you as a small company figure out how do I not fall in that trap? You know, you're starting to see we're, we're doing a lot of research in those areas. Um, so definitely check out that information. Wonderful. No, those are great resources for everybody on the LinkedIn Live. The uh, Matthew's information is in the data uh in the introduction and then for those of you that are on the zoom right now i have just re-put it into the chat panel so you can check it out there we unfortunately are not going to be having open networking today but you can reach out to him via that avenue i know we had a lot of questions this morning matthew thank you so much for such an informative session this morning i think it's fascinating i kind of sit on the big side big company and in the startup side so I love that we were able to talk across the gamut today. Thank you so much for being with us and spending the time. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me, Christy. Looking forward to the next one. Yes, we will love to see you on another Friday. For those of you um, that are Friday Coffee Meetup members, our next session is going to be on June 4th. We are meeting on the first and third Fridays of the month. And on June 4th, we're gonna be hearing from Jason Schottler around C to Series A all the ins and outs around getting that funding and, and that experience. So thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend ahead. We appreciate you being here with us. Take good care. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone.